All right, guys, remember the name. Carlos Brethwaite is with us, and we're going to ask some questions. Carlos, how are you feeling? Good. A little nervous. Not sure what questions are coming. Oh, they're, they're just <laughs> I trust you to not throw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't. Uh, first of all, remember the name. Tell us about that innings. Obviously, it was a lot of pressure. It was a final. You're playing in India. Uh, what was your mindset like over there? Um, it was actually quite good. One that I've been searching for. Um, and I think as a sports person, you always talk about that flow state where you're just reacting um, and you're allowing your instincts to take over. And I think on that occasion, for that innings, um, it was good communication between myself and Marlon, um, but it was in a real good mindset as well. I just allowed my instinct to, to, to take over at the time. Um, and there's a couple things from the innings that I really enjoyed. Um, there was one over where we didn't get as many boundaries as we wanted and Marlon was like he's not running any singles either two or four or six and when I've been practicing the little scoop all tournament even our pre-camp um, fine leg was up and I figured now was the best time to play so that scoop off David really I really enjoyed that one my dad didn't enjoy it that much <laughs> up, up until today he still telling me it's a crap shot and I shouldn't have played it although I got four and we won the game um, and then obviously you know in the midst of the four sixes I think after the third six um, just looking back up to the VIP area where the West Indies women they had won just before us um, they stayed to support us my girlfriend no wife was there as well the other families were there so just a nice moment within the chaos to be able to celebrate it with friends family um, and colleagues so yeah, those two moments stand up to me and i think it was your day it was like it was such a perfect recipe right there you played a similar innings against new zealand in 2019 and then you got out just shy of five runs to chase how did you feel about that yeah it was heartbroken to be honest i wanted to score international century um, and I obviously got a chance to do it there and I love the city of Manchester, I'm a Manchester United fan um, and then I later went on to represent Manchester Originals in the 100. Um, so to be able to score my only international century in Manchester just across the road from my beloved Old Trafford football ground uh -huh. um, was a nice story. Um, but I was upset because I want to win games for the team with bat in hand um, and I thought that that was probably one of my better innings in my career when it comes to batsmanship. There were different periods of the innings where um, came into bat, we were ahead of the run rate but losing wickets, steady the ship, then losing wickets at the other end but then building partnerships with the lower order. Um, so it showed different skill sets with bat in hand, really tested um, batsmanship um, and then the final partnership, I think we needed 48 or something like that and I got 42 of them, or Shane Thomas, none. <laughs> um, so it would be a nice story to be able to get a 50 round partnership or at least get close to it and be the person to score all 50 runs. Um, but yeah, I think it's one of my better innings because of the batsmanship and the different challenges throughout the innings and the different stages of play. Um, but I was crestfallen not to get over the mark. Um, and it's still an innings that I refer to when I think back of how to play certain situations and potentially what could I have done differently to finish the game. Interesting. And obviously, uh, you guys play around the world. You can be rivals on the ground, but obviously there's a lot of friendship around the world. Uh, good chemistry throughout. You have an interesting friendship with Shana Was Dahani. Tell us mm. about that. Um, yeah, it, it, it was really organic, to be fair. Um, so, rocked up to PSL, um, and he was just like a kid in the candy store. Like he was there, he was enjoying it, he was lapping it up, talking to everyone, like really buzzing. Um, so he made a connection right away. I think when I come into a dressing room overseas, for me it's a privilege to be able to play all around the world. Cricket has done so much for me. And then I think if I come into a dressing room and a youngster wants to pick my brain and I don't give him the time of day, if I have it, um, then I'll be doing a disservice to the game. So we got chatting. Um, funny enough, one of our first chats was about how much he loves Shea Hope. <laughs> so I sent a video of him professing his love for Shea Hope to Shea Hope. Um, and yeah, we just got closer then, training, talking, life. Um, and I 
think one thing that stuck with me is he played a game. He didn't start, but he came and he played a game. He bowled a good first over. I don't, I don't think he got a wicket, if memory serves me correct. But then he walks down to the boundary and he's like giving it big ones to the crowd. And then a couple of the other overseas were like, who's this little upstart? Like, why are you waving to the crowd? Like, you ever get a wicket? It's not a hat trick. You ever win the game? It's literally just your first over in PSL. Um, so I think we went on to win the game. He bowled well. Um, and then when he came off the field, like, I made some jokes at him about it. And he was like, no, bro, those are all the people from my village that would have oh. driven and took train 10, 14 hours to get there. Yes. I felt so bad. <laughs> because in that moment, he was just embracing a fan following from his village. Yeah. And there I was, without knowledge of that, thinking, who's this little kid? <laughs> um, and I think that conversation really showed me that, you know, as busybody as he is, um, you know, he's taking some stick on social media for how he interacts with opposition with teammates like how buzzy he is I think he really has a passion for people mm -hmm. and for the game um, and I think if people can look past what seems to be this annoying little kid who's always here there and everywhere like a little chihuahua you'd actually realize how nice of a person yeah. he is mm -hmm. um, so it was really nice we won that PSL um, and he went back home to a nice a welcome, parade, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So it was really heartening to see his village show up for him on his debut, and then also welcoming back to the village once he was a champion. He played a big role, went on to play for Pakistan, and I have no doubt that he'll be back at the top in no time. He's a sensational talent, bowls quick, mm -hmm. good skills, and he's a nice person. He loves the game, good passion for people, and you want to see people like that. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And what's the story behind the phone call gesture that you do? Oh, so one of the things he spoke about, um, he was just saying that he's watched me and he knows I love my celebrations and my dances and stuff. So he was asking me, like, why do I do it? And he said, look, to be honest, we, when we get professional, we forget that little kid inside of us that was just playing in the road and just so happy to get a wicket. In the Caribbean, we used to play, you have to bowl and get the person out to be able to bat, or you play whoever's batting last, bats first the next day. So like, as soon as it say get dark as a batter, you're just trying to just hold on so you can bat first. And then when you've got a ball in hand, you're trying to get out the batter so you can bat. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember just getting people out and just playing yes, and just celebrating and enjoying it. You're living for that moment every evening after school. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to rekindle that well as a professional, like once you start being paid and start working, you forget that love. And I never wanted to forget that kid inside. So my celebrations bring that out essentially. And he was like, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> if I play, this is before his debut obviously, if I play, come and do a celebration with me. If I get a wicket or you get a wicket and that would help to relax me. Uh, and I do not even remember like, the origin of it. Um, I don't know if he did it in practice or something before, but again, I, I give him some stick because I think that was his celebration and he did something crazy, like this first celebration, I think we've still got a photo, first celebration was like a wrong hand or a wrong finger was out or something like that, but it was good fun. And as he said, it did relax him. Uh -huh. So he looked forward to doing that celebration and I look forward to doing it with him because if we're doing celebrations, we're taking away KC team yeah. and benefiting. Um, so yeah, it was kind of organic, it was kind of funny as well. And I think the funniest part of it is the fact that he messed it up first, first time <laughs> around and now it's a trademark. Right, and, and as a West Indian, how do you feel a two-time world champion not playing this World Cup? Yeah, it was tough. Um, I was part of the commentary team at the qualifiers as well. Um, so I have experienced it as a player in 2018, having to play the qualifiers and you know how tough it is. Um, and then experiencing it as a commentator and not qualifying. Yeah, it was heartbreaking because you referred to 2019 and my century and I know how important it is to get that platform and to be able to perform in a World Cup. Everyone wants to play in a World Cup. Um, so you look at that group of players and you think there are some players in there who may never perform or have the opportunity to platform to play in a World Cup. So it's heartbroken for them. Um, for West Indies cricket, like I think we still got a really long way to go. We've been left behind. Um, for a whole number of reasons, 
this interview will probably go on for about four hours if we start talking <laughs> about the problems in West Indies cricket. And I don't think it's just players, I don't think it's just administration, I think it's a holistic system change um, that we need to employ and you know, get back to what our beliefs are, uh, find a way of playing and then just stick with that. Um, but yeah, it was heartbroken for the team, um, for the West Indies cricket fans, but as a cricket purist, I don't have a problem with it because I think cricket as a game is too close shop. We expect to see the same teams year in, year out, playing against each other in bilateral series, playing against each other in World Cups. If we really want to be a global game, we need to have loads of other teams being exposed to high level international cricket. Um, and if that means that some of your perennial powerhouses will miss out from time to time, then so be it. Because at the end of the day, we how much of a country is 100 and how much of a country is really and truly only 10, 12 countries consistently represent cricket at a global event. And I don't think that's good enough. So until we can get to the stage where we have 20, 24 teams and it's serious competition, I don't think we can grow the game globally. So West Indies missing out, being a larger part of that. It's not a problem in my eyes. All right, Carlos, it was it was fantastic talking to you, and uh, I wish you the best for this season and, and upcoming season. So, guys, this was Carlos Brethways. Remember the name. We got a lot of action coming in, not just in T10, but in other formats as well. And see you soon.